Hi everyone, Nicole and I are happy to welcome you at our next Art and Conversation seminar. Today we're discussing creativity and as usual we have two speakers who will give their talks and after that we'll have a discussion. And during the discussion everyone will have a chance to write to ask a question or maybe leave a comment, which you can do by raising your hands or writing down your question in the chat and we'll read them to the speakers. So our first speaker is Rebecca Chamberlain, lecturer in psychology at the Goldsmiths University of London. Dr. Chamberlain investigates how and why individuals create and respond so powerfully to works of art. Her research focuses on the psychology and neuroscience of the production and perception of visual art. Dr. Chamberlain is particularly interested in the mechanisms by which artists acquire their expertise and the impact of engagement with the visual arts can have on education and mental health. She is also interested in how individual differences in perception interact with learning and cognition. Uh, Dr. Chamberlain, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and we look forward for your talk. Please share your screen whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so. Okay, can you see my slides okay? Yes. Fab, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm a, a psychologist and uh, yeah, as Bruno said, my predominantly my research focuses around uh, artistic expertise um, and its relationships to aesthetics. So I'm very much coming to the topic of creativity today uh, with that lens. Um, so what I want to sort of tackle in this um, brief talk is talk a bit about what we know about the origins of artistic um, creativity and how useful this might be to understand uh, the production and perception of, um, of art in the modern day world. And then I want to talk a bit about some of the methodological challenges um, posed by studying artistic creativity um, from a psychological and neuroscientific perspective. Um, and then sort of briefly go over some of um, some empirical observations and theoretical observations about the nature of artistic um, creativity and its psychological and neuroscientific um, correlates. And then I focus um, in the second part a bit more on uh, work that is more directly related to my research, which is um, whether if any um, relationship exists between um, artistic creative performance and the kind of perceptual abilities and skills that are developed through artistic training. And then what I feel are a couple of um, topics that really deserve um, more focus in the in the literature and in our domain um, on the role of persistence and discernment in creativity. So a shift away from focus on idea gen gen uh, generation into more uh, work on how we evaluate whether ideas are, are good ideas or not. Um, so that's sort of a, a rough outline of the kinds of things I'm going to be talking about. Um, so first to start, um, sort of how did artistic um, creative cre creativity emerge in our evolutionary history and, and what is art for? Um, so to look at this, we go back to um, what's called the Big Bang of human culture, the upper period Paleolithic era about 60 um, between 60 and 30,000 years ago. This is where we see evidence of um, the emergence of rituals within human behavior. So we see evidence of complex burial sites and art forms ranging from sort of dance, magic, totemism, and then obviously evidence um, accumulates here for, um, for visual art and visual um, creativity. So that's most notably seen in the archaeological record of um, cave paintings, but also in things like decorated pot, um, pottery and um, sort of adornments and, and artifacts um, that are decorated. And Evidence for these sort of distinct um, types of um, artistic artifacts sort of um, can be separated into um, uh, paintings and artworks that seem more sort of representational in nature and perhaps maybe more symbolic and those that represent more kind of abstract uh, representations. And it was previously thought that um, that, that these kind of abstract representations preceded uh, representational uh, depictions and um, the cognitive um, evolutionary development of humans sort of was was mapped by um, an increase in, in representation. Um, but what we now know from the archaeological record is it's a lot more um, 
uh, sort of there's a lot more intermixing of these two different types of artistic production, abstract and representational, and these don't necessarily nicely sort of track the cognitive development. We also know now that um, these kinds of depictions are not specific to Homo sapiens. So uh, these carved deer bone fragments on the right here, um, uh, actually there's strong support that these um, these were generated by uh, Neanderthals. Um, and so the, the specialism of, um, of artistic production to Homo sapiens has been challenged in recent years. So we have this complex picture of an emergence of um, sort of visual artistic um, creativity around this time and there's still a huge amount of debate as to what these what these artifacts and these depictions are for. One researcher Ellen Desaniaki talks about the fact that all of um, so these these dance rituals, these um, evidence of early um, musical instruments and artworks are represented representative of sort of uh, our early human ancestors making things special by either exaggerating or repeating or simplifying elements of um, the environment around us. Um, and so this is a really sort of strong theme of, of what art is able to do and what it what it does sort of uh, translating to the modern day. Um, so where are we now? We're, we're very divorced from these sort of early um, representations to the point where um, theoreticians have suggested that we're sort of witnessing the death of art. So this was classically put forward by Colin Martindale in the 1990s, um, that the ratchet effect of cultural evolution and the, and the, the sort of the exaggeration of particular sort of artistic trends and modes of depiction have mean that we've sort of exhausted the possibilities um, for artworks. And as a result, there's very little coherence to artistic practice and, and reception in, in modern day life. Um, you know, the, the cliche goes that art can be anything that we that we say it is. Um, and I don't necessarily sort of take as pessimistic view for, for what that means for a psychology of art in the sense that I buy into this perspective put forward by Aaron Cosbelt last year um, that suggests that we still have what's called the attractive um, attracting force of canalized biases. That is that there are constraints on the way that we think about the world and perceive the world that still bias our reception and production of aesthetic artifacts. And they might have be they might be hangovers from uh, this early emergence of artistic uh, creativity um, amongst our, our human ancestors. And this sort of relates to a point that was made by um, early theorists in neuroaesthetics in the in the sort of 1990s, so Semi Ezeki and uh, Ramachandran, that suggests that um, that artworks play on the, the mechanisms and structure of the visual system. And some really nice examples of this were put forward by um, Margaret Liven Livingston in a book in the early 2000s. Um, and this is one example of the Mona Lisa. So she argues that the elusiveness of the Mona Lisa smile um, can be explained by the fact that uh, when we're either close to the artwork or further away, we process different spatial frequencies in the image and these different spatial frequencies convey different information about the uh, the facial expression of the Mona Lisa. Um, and so this the ambiguity of the Mona Lisa smile is a function of the way that our visual system processes um, the image at different um, distances. And this is also um, this argument has been made similarly for the emergence of um, kind of abstract depictions in early artworks, um, suggesting that you know, the reason why these kinds of marks are made in these particular um, types of way and these kind of geometric patterns plays on the fact that early parts of our visual system respond to contour and line and edges. Um, so there's still quite a strong sort of theme that um, artistic creativity um, emerged and uh, continues to sort of excite observers as a result of the fact that it excites the visual brain. Um, and this is something I sort of talked about in a recent paper about the artist Pierre Bonnard, along with um, Robert Pepperell from Cardiff, uh, where we explore the use of um, Bonnard's use of um, color contrast um, in his artworks to play around with um, 
the sort of the edges of objects and figure ground relationships. And we see Monet do this really effectively as well and it is hit in his work. So what artists are often doing and not necessarily um, sort of working with the visual system and creating an image that is really fluently processed, but actually identifying those mechanisms of, of the visual system that can be um, presented with an ambiguity and sort of and, and confused in order to give people a more interesting visual experience. So this is how I think potentially the, the, the sort of the development of art and um, the, the biases within our visual system can be played upon in, um, in creative ways. So to move on to the more sort of um, practical aspect of um, being a researcher in um, in artistic creativity, uh, one of the, the questions I get asked the most is, well, how do you reliably measure creativity? Again, it seems like this very subjective thing. Um, it appears in all, all kinds of forms. It's very hard to sort of um, pin down to a singular concept. Um, and the field has developed a number of different ways of getting at this question. Um, so firstly, we have tasks um, that we call sort of ge domain general creative tasks uh, that tend to focus on uh, what's called divergent and convergent thinking. Divergent thinking being um, the ability to generate a lot of ideas in relation to some kind of probe and convergent thinking being able to arrive at a creative answer to a particular problem where, there, where sort of one solution exists. Um, and obviously we can already see that um, whilst um, intuitively the, the nature of these tasks might relate to artistic creativity, it's not really about artistic creativity per se, it's not about creativity in a specific medium, it's really focused on how many um, you know, creative ideas can you generate within the con context of a task. For example, if I give you if I say, you know, take a brick and think of lots of um, unusual or alternative uses for this brick, how many can you generate? We start to get to a more sort of ecologically valid um, impression of creative ability when we consider something like the consensual assessment technique, which was developed by Teresa Amabile in the 1980s, which asks um, uh, participants to come in and make some kind of creative product in sort of lab conditions and then ask um, a series of, um, uh, to ask a group of experts or quasi experts to um, uh, rate the creativity of the output. Can I just check, can you still hear me okay? Because I'm getting a warning that my internet connection is not yes, great. Yes, we, we can, thank you. Yeah. Okay, fab. Um, so um, so the domain general creativity tasks and these consensual um, assessment techniques, um, looks at creativity from the perspective of sort of lab-based studies and obviously we can get quantifiable measures of how creative these outputs are. Um, another approach is to sort of go out in the world and ask people about their creative achievements and look at how those creative achievements vary and whether we can think about any um, sort of psychological or neuropsychological um, predictors of those achievements. And so one uh, sort of questionnaire self-report um, measure that's used quite frequently in, in the literature is the creative achievement questionnaire. And that essentially asks people to um, uh, enumerate the number of sort of creative achievements um, they have ranging from sort of I've displayed my photographs in a local art gallery to I have international recognition in my field. Um, and this gets more at the sort of real life creative achievements that we might be interested in when we're thinking about what what predicts creativity. And then finally, we have historiometric approaches that look at the role of sort of eminent um, creative individuals in terms of their relationship between um, with predictors of creativity. Um, so, you know, we look at um, musicians and composers like Beethoven and we try to extrapolate from the historical record some understanding of how he came to be so creatively successful. So putting these tasks into context in a model of um, uh, sort of creativity in general, we can see that um, sort of the convergent divergent thinking tasks, the domain general tasks, tend to represent the idea of cognitive creative potential. So some kind of foundation upon which more specific domain specific um, creative abilities can be can be laid on top. Um, and when we look at things like the consensual assessment technique and 
historiometric and questionnaire based measures, these represent more the, the, the sort of top layer, the output of these creative processes. Um, and in this work by Jauk that looks at the relationship between sort of everyday creative activities, creative achievement and cognitive creative potential, we can see two other psychological factors that seem to be quite important in determining um, whether whether someone uh, produces creative outcomes. And that is openness to experience, which is one of the big five um, personality traits, which links in with cognitive creative potential and predicts an individual's tendency to engage with creative tasks on a daily basis. And then also intelligence, which again feeds into these kind of convergent divergent thinking tasks and also contributes to creative achievement. So we have a nice sort of holistic model here of the different kind of um, interplay of different psychological factors that might predict whether someone uh, might um, creatively achieve over the course of their lifespan. Touching briefly on neural correlates of artistic activity, um, there isn't a huge amount of literature um, in this domain. So it was nice to see this meta-analysis that was published last year that not only looked at um, neural mechanisms involved in creativity per se, but actually looked at domain-specific um, uh, uh, engagement of um, neural networks. So. Um, what we see from this meta-analysis that um, sort of compares musical drawing and literary creativity, that, it, that there is quite a substantial overlap um, in, in these creative tasks. And we see this um, specifically in regions that are involved in sort of motor planning and execution, and also in frontal regions that represent sort of executive function, working memory and inhibitory control. And this will relate a little bit to some of the um, sort of open questions I want to draw on um, at the end of this talk that we kind of um, we focus a lot on idea generation in our notions of creativity. But actually, um, these mechanisms of kind of controlling our responses and um, and selecting appropriate um, responses to a task seem to be as important as the, the idea generation process. And interestingly, in this meta-analysis, when we when we contrast um, drawing um, creativity to the other forms of creativity, um, somewhat predictably, we find um, more involvement of visual and imagery areas. Um, so we are seeing some some specialist involvement um, at the sensory level that seems to be co contributing to creativity in this domain. Um, and that's what I want to to pick up on now, um, and in relation to some of my own work. Um, so I've been working on the, the idea that there might be um, a link between creative ability and attentional flexibility. And we can see this in um, in artworks. So, for example, with the Picasso bullhead here, there's a uh, sort of Picasso um, told this anecdote about how he came up with this artwork. He was just in his garage one day, saw the uh, the bike bicycle seat and the bicycle handlebars and then they suddenly came together in his mind to form the bull's head and I think this is a really good example of where maybe an artist's sort of attentional flexibility their ability to attend to the to the sensory environment in in interesting and novel ways might lead to creative insight and this was something that um I studied in a in a research study a couple of years ago Sorry, I don't think the video is working, but uh, never mind. Um, where we used a bistable um, uh, image. So it's a field of rotating dots that forms a 3D cylinder shape. Um, and the fields of dots can change in terms of their depth um, perspective. And so you either see the cylinder rotating to the left or to the right. And this uh, switches at sort of um, regular intervals. Um, and what we saw in this study, so we compared artists and non-artists and the degree to which they witnessed these um, switches, these these sort of bistable switches over the course of a few minutes. And what we found was that in a condition in which we just asked um, participants to report how often these switches happened, um, we didn't see uh, much difference between the, the two artistic groups. But when we asked uh, participants to switch uh, between the percepts as rapidly as they could, we found that the artists were much um, more able to do this. Um, so what I want to sort of conjecture here is that this, um, yeah, this flexible visual attention might give rise to some of the creative insights that that we see and that artists really use this ability to see the see the world in different ways to think about the world in different ways. 
And one topic that I'm I'm becoming more and more interested in um, in relation to this is this notion of um, pareidolia or the, the ability to see signal in noisy stimuli. So we see this often in the case of sort of seeing faces in the clouds or um, seeing pattern in uh, patterns in tea leaves. Um, and, and this is a measurable individual difference. So some people are more inclined to, to see signal and noise and some less so. Um, and previous research has shown this, this actually relates to the personality trait of schizotypy, which is related to schizophrenia. Um, and so I think it's it, it's sensible to maybe project that if you if you have this attentional flexibility in in um, and your ability to sort of manipulate the way in which you see the visual environment, that it also might be possible that you're more likely to see uh, signal and noise. And we can often see this sort of at play in real abstract artworks. So the image on the left here is one by um, artist Robert Pepperell. Uh, by which he tries to, he gives the, um, the sort of indication of there being identifiable objects within the stimulus, but when you get closer, you realise that, that this is not the case. So before I move on, I just want to talk about um, some research that looks at whether um, there are sort of differential correlations between uh, sort of technical ability, which has previously been linked quite strongly with these kind of perceptual expertise, attentional flexibility effects, and um, creative um, uh, artistic ability. Um, and in this study by Matthew and Pulowski and colleagues, what they had people do was a creative drawing task and a copying task where they just, um, where participants just needed to make um, a faithful copy of, um, of an image. And they did find differential correlations between performance on these tasks and other tasks. So what they found was that for the copying task, um, some uh, independent tasks measuring individual differences in perceptual abilities correlated more strongly, whereas um, performance on the creative drawing task tended to uh, predict creative achievement through things like creative achievement questionnaires. So there is some suggestion in the literature that there might be a, a bit of a divergent in terms of what um, what these artistic tasks predict, but I suggest that there are um, there's more overlap and more common mechanisms that haven't been sort of um, illuminated by research thus far. Um, and for the last um, sort of minute or so, I I just want to um, sort of open up maybe topics that I think would be interesting to discuss in this context and and areas where I think we really need to do more research. Um, and I was taken by this recent paper that um, showed that sort of non-experts underestimate the value of persistence in creativity and overestimate the value of insight. And I sort of want to say that um, I think this is the case for our research field in general. I think I think the the current sort of models and empirical research tends to focus a lot on, um, you know, moments of insight and um, the the part of the creative process that involves the sort of the generation of ideas. Um, and actually that this idea that artistic creativity is hard work and persistence and often repeating the same task again and again and again is sort of undervalued in society at large. And I think that, that has knock on effects for what becomes interesting to focus on as uh, scientific researchers. And there's been a little bit of work on on sort of discernment and the ability to evaluate ideas, um, both from a historiometric approach. So Aaron Cosbelt did some nice work on um, work on Beethoven that showed that he actually became better at being able to predict which compositions would be hits as a function of his age. Uh, which is in sort of direct contrast with um, Dean Siementon's view, which is that um, artists um, and composers just produce um, creative works with no knowledge of which ones will ultimately be successful. And also some work by Paul Sylvia in the lab showing that um, there are reliable predictors of who can um, best pick their, their most creative ideas. And those predictors are quite similar to the predictors of creative creative achievement in general. So individuals with more openness to experience are better at selecting the most creative ideas as judged by other people. Um, so I think this is a really rich area of investigation. And I think 
I generally want to make the argument that I think we need to focus more on this evaluative process. And I think we need to take more seriously the role of uh, perceptual expertise in, in the creative process. Um, so I hope I haven't gone too much over time. Um, and thank you very much. And I look forward to discussing this. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And uh, the timing was perfect. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions, uh, but um, I'd like first to introduce our second speaker today. Um, uh, uh, today we have Dustin Stokes, who is an associate professor in philosophy and University of Utah. Um, yeah, professor Stokes works primarily on philosophy of mind and cognitive science, and is interested in the interplay between sense perception and cognition, and how psychology and science can inform philosophical theories of these relations. Professor Stokes' research on creativity indeed adopts uh, this uh, multidisciplinary approach uh, with the aim of shedding light on human thought and behaviors and to better understand how imagination and creative thinking differs from other mental capacities. Uh, Professor Stokes, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation today and uh, please feel free to share um, your screen and we look forward to your talk. Um, thank you very much, Nicole, for that very kind um, introduction, and thank you to both of both of you for in, inviting me to, uh, to speak. Um, I'm slightly distracted because I want to make sure that I we get this right the second time. So everybody, bear with me for just one moment here. Okay. So now you see everything, don't you? We, we see your presenter's slides at the moment. Okay. That's not, and that's not quite the right thing. So I knew it would take a second to figure out. No worries, thank <laughs> you. I the machine a few times this last time, and, and now I don't remember just how I kicked it. So now you don't see any of my screen, correct? Not at the moment. Okay. okay, here we go. Let's try this. And then. No. Yeah, I can see your your presentation. Yes. Okay, good. That's great. All right, so um, sorry for the delay. So uh, thank you again for having me. Um, I think uh, Rebecca's uh, talk, in particular the comments that she made at the, at the last, in the last couple of minutes will be a nice segue to what um, I'm trying to do. So this is an attempt to bring to bear um, work that I've done on cognitive influence on perception, uh, to bring it to bear on work that I've also done on creativity. And in the past, these have been entirely disparate um, projects. So part of the goal here is just to uh, made it motivate perhaps only for myself that the, there's going to be fruit to be born by by bringing the two together. Um, so here's uh, and this will also I think this the following observations will connect nicely with Rebecca's comments. I, I mean, I think I agree entirely with you that there's this remarkable overemphasis on the insight aha sort of um, eureka moment in both the psychology and philosophy of creativity and not enough emphasis on how the artist or scientist or whomever actually takes that idea and, and makes it into the thing that we ultimately get. So here, with that in mind as, a, as an apparent platitude, I think creativity in science and art often involves expert level skill. Um, but given, I think, uh, what is also an overemphasis in creativity research on so-called radical creativity or genius, uh, there hasn't been very much said about how creativity sometimes involves expert level skill. I mean, there has, there's a there's been a, a bit said, in fact, Barra Scott, who I think is in the house, as it were, has, has said something about it, but um, he's one of the only persons I know who has. So the thesis that I want to explore is first, uh, and this is the part about which I'll be very brief. I'm, I'm giving you essentially a, a few minutes of what I try to capture in a book, but the, the, the theme in that book is that um, sometimes expertise can reach all the way down to the level of perception. We can become expert level perceivers as a result of some very domain specific training. Um, and then I want to suggest, if you at least accept that for the sake of argument, that in some cases, and there's a there's a big sum that quantifies almost everything that I have to say here. I don't think that any of this is going to give a full explanation of creative activities, but I think it will give us some new explanatory tools that haven't been sufficiently explored. 
So if we can become perceptual experts, I want to suggest that in some cases this enables automatic skilled performance uh, with reduced need for working memory specific to a task and that it thereby reduces cognitive load and opens up space for novel thinking, imagination, free association, and the other things that we think may be important for creative thought and behavior. Um, so it, I'm the resident philosopher in this symposium, but I should say that this is going to sound a lot like a, a second talk from a psychologist. So um, that's just, that's how I work. <laughs> um, so to make this case, I'm going to say a little bit about um, some empirical research on perceptual expertise, and then say a little bit about how I think about it in terms of its mental architecture, um, and then finally turn to how I think this could inform or provide a plausible psychological framework for understanding the relationship between expertise, skill, and creativity for at least some cases. So um, before I turn to perceptual expertise, I'm going to say a little bit about how I've in the past conceived of creativity and some of these notions will become relevant. I'll then say a little bit about perceptual expertise and then finally turn to how we can think about expertise in the context of creativity. Okay, so in a number of papers I've characterized um, creativity minimally. Um, and so this is notice uh, and only if I've said that some thought or action is minimally creative only if for some agent A, X is the non-accidental result of the agency of A and X is psychologically or behaviorally, rel uh, behaviorally novel relative to A. So this is an attempt to start a naturalistic account of creativity. It by no means purports to you know, provide all the answers that we want, but it's an attempt also to um, push against the overemphasis on radical cases of genius and so forth. I think from the perspective of cognitive science, those aren't the right starting points. So just to highlight two features of um, uh, the, the definition, this is a, there's, there's a novelty component, which I take it most, uh, if not all persons think is important to creativity. Uh, Maggie Bowden and others will be familiar with this, uh, famously distinguishes between historical and psychological creativity. I think this is really a distinction between two different sorts of novelty where um, some uh, action or thought can be novel relative to some large comparison class, say the history of ideas, but it could also be novel relative just to the agent and her past activities or thoughts and so forth. And I think from the perspective of cognitive science, um, the historical creativity does not exhaust our interests. We're also interested in the sort of more mundane version. Um, the agency condition is supposed to capture the fact that creative thoughts and behaviors are ones for which we're responsible. And I think that's evidenced by how we generally praise persons for doing things that are creative. So I just want to highlight when you put these two features together, there's a puzzle that emerges. So on the, on the one hand, um, creative achievement is often described as effortless and it's often rapid or in the moment. Um, so improvisation uh, in performance arts and in sport are good examples. But on the other hand, creativity does seem to be an achievement. It seems to be the sort of thing that we praise. Um, and that's the point of the agency condition. But there's a puzzle uh, of making, I think there's a, there's a sort of tension um, between those, those, those two features. And so I wanna come back to that later. I'll call that the puzzle of the effortless creative agent. So this is only a start. Um, to sort of think about creativity in a sort of a mundane way. That's one of the things I think about creativity from a philosoph philosophical perspective. Um, closely connected to the thought that creativity necessarily involves agency is the commitment that creativity is primarily a process. Um, I think creativity involves creating, and even when we attribute creativity ostensibly to a product, I think the product will be creative only if it's the result or terminus of a product, uh, sorry, a process of the right kind. I think, um, so it, I ultimately say something that sounds sort of trivial, namely that you have to have the right kind of process, which on a view that I've argued for, constitutive, constitutively involves agency. That might sound obvious, but it has again important consequences because to know or to understand or properly attribute creativity to anything, you have to know something to some degree about the process from which it resulted. And this is something I maybe will come up in discussion that I want to connect with um, uh, some of Rebecca's comments about persistence. I think if we think about creativity as an achievement in this way, um, it encourages a virtue theoretic uh, account of creativity in, in certain respects. So I'll just drop that in as a point of provocation. Um, so finally, as I hope nobody would disagree, the creative process often involves imagination. And so one way that I've attempted to flesh this out um, is as follows. So I identify what I call a cognitive manipulation role. It says that creative thought and behavior requires cognitive manipulation, and that I characterize as typically involving 
voluntarily thinking about the contents of some conceptual uh, space or domain in non-truth bound ways. And there's more to the story, but just with that much of the story in mind, I think that um, imagination serves this role uh, especially well. Um, I think it, it and, and accordingly, it's why it plays a, a kind of central psychological role in much of creative thought and action. Okay, so that's background about creativity. Um, so there's, as probably many of you know, there are empirical studies on perceptual expertise as such, focusing on a wide range of specialized domains, as you see here, ranging from um, you know, forensics, fingerprint examination, uh, expert level or elite level athletes, bird watching. And then you can train subjects to become perceptual experts with respect to artificial objects, like as you see in pink here, um, greebles. So this is going to be a very quick um, capture of what is a very long abductive argument for me. So I just want to say a little bit about the sorts of studies that are employed in this uh, empirical literature. So behavioral studies on perceptual experts of various kinds, radiologists, elite athletes, car experts, lab trained experts, they show a common pattern of features. Um, so experts can perform their tasks extremely rapidly and accurately. They seem to rely more on configural features of objects of expertise, and they're more sensitive to the whole often enough than its individual features. And indeed, holistic processing is the explanation broadly favored by these researchers. Um, experts are very sensitive to objects of expertise when presented in ecologically valid ways. And when, for example, you invert objects of expertise, experts typically do worse than novices on relevant tasks. Indeed, their expertise seems to be deployed automatically such that they can't turn it off in those invalid circumstances. Further expertise of various kinds interferes with face expertise, which is a kind of perceptual expertise that with important qualifications, it seems all humans enjoy. Um, those behavioral studies are corroborated by both EEG studies and um, fMRI studies. So one such study concerns the ERP component or the e event related potential uh, N 170. So this is standardly taken to be a marker for face recognition act activity. Um, it occurs uh, 170 to 230 milliseconds, I think, post stimulus. I might have gotten that slightly wrong. And then there's the N250 component, which is the familiarity um, response. Everyone has this response to their own face. That's a little slower. I want to say it's somewhere between 250 and 330 milliseconds post stimulus. These are taken to be face facial neural correlates. And what's interesting is that you see amplified activity for experts with respect to objects of their expertise only across a range of expertise. Secondly, um, the fusiform face area and the occipital face area are standard neural markers um, for face recognition, but they also show activity for experts for their objects of expertise. Finally, um, eye tracking uh, shows substantial differences in psychotic eye movement. Uh, so, for example, expert radiologists will rely more on holistic processing of an image on uh, feature based attentional selection. And so they have to make fewer eye movements for rapid diagnosis. diagnosis. They also make uh, longer saccades. So summarizing a long uh, and complicated abductive argument, I think this convergence of evidence is best explained with both a perceptual claim and um, a cognitive claim. So I think there are perceptual differences between experts and non-experts, but I also think that those differences sometimes depend importantly on um, the cognitive learning of the expert in question. And so that's why I uh, claim that perceptual expertise is both genuinely perceptual and genuinely um, cognitive, at least in some cases. Uh, another part of the story, which I argue in um, a book that I just published, is, is that we should think about these cases in terms of epistemic virtue. So I think in some respects, if you're um, uh, compelled by the architecture that I identify for some of these cases of expertise, the epistemology comes easy. They're clearly improving, but I think um, a virtue epistemology captures the sense in which they as agents have improved how they see. So in the book, um, uh, I characterize this in terms of a malleable architecture of the mind and the unfortunately acronymed theses. I mean, acronyms are always bad, but these actually make sense for what it's worth. So I, I argue for the TAP thesis, which says that thinking affects perceiving and the TIP thesis, which is that thinking improves perceiving. So if that's at all compelling uh, to you, this is the book where I where I make that case at much, much greater length. Um, OK. So what I want to do is try uh, to bring all of that to bear on the topic of creativity. So here again is the apparent platitude. Some creative acts or processes involve the execution of highly domain specific skills. 
And I think that creative individuals such as those that you see here are experts. Now, what I want to suggest is that some of them are plausibly domain specific perceptual experts in the ways that I just described and that these advantages um, that that they have by virtue of being better perceivers might help us to explain how they achieve some of their creative innovations. So some in, in some domains where individuals act creative, creatively are highly perceptual in nature, um, such as those that you see on the screen here. Performance in these domains requires, in a non-trivial way, pick up a, a pickup of information through one or more of the senses. And what I want to suggest is that in some cases, the creativity that occurs in such domains depends not just on expertise, but on perceptual expertise. Again, some creative indiv individuals are plausibly perceptual experts. So to motivate this claim, I need to answer this question. How does perceptual expertise provide an advantage for thinking or acting creatively? Here's a boring answer. Uh, performance in a domain requires knowing how to perform in that domain. So accordingly, being an expert in a domain is an advantage over someone who has little or no skill in that domain. I mean, to paint creatively, you have to be able to paint. To improvise a piano solo, you have to be able to play the piano and, and so on. Here's a more controversial answer. Perceptual expertise provides a genuine cognitive advantage over mere experts and novices by freeing cognitive resources for cognitive manipulation, as I understand it, and accordingly imagination. So this is the thesis that I want to briefly clarify and motivate. <clears throat> Given some, uh, so this is a, a ray of evidence that I draw on to argue for perceptual expertise as I understand it. Given some of this evidence, you might already see how the perceptual expert has a cognitive advantage over others. She sees things more rapidly. She does so automatically, often with no feeling of effort. She's more sensitive to patterns and spatial organization than the non-expert. She has more information to inform and organize her judgments within the domain of expertise. So some of the advantages for the expert should already be apparent and I think uncontroversial. Um, but what is controversial again is that some experts are in fact better perceivers. And as I understand it, they enjoy enriched uh, perceptual representation of objects, features, and events within their domain. So that's the controversial claim that I wanna um, say a bit more about to connect it with uh, some explanations of creative achievement. So some perceptual experts enjoy rich perceptual content. Uh, as most of you will know, this cuts against orthodoxy, which maintains that vision, for example, only provides information about properties like color, shape, size, rest, motion. But in making this claim, I don't make any commitment to the claim that vision provides information about kind properties. Instead, I commit to something like this. I think that visual representation, I think that, that, that um, in these cases, you get visual representation of a, a pattern or gestalt partly constituted by, um, but not exhausted by instances of low level properties. So I think in the cases of expertise, you get enhanced perceptual sensitivity to patterns, configurations, organizational features, um, and gestalts. I think this is true, whether uh, the domain concerns radiographs or um, red tailed hawks. Uh, but interestingly, I think the lesson can be learned by considering perception of aesthetic properties. So a famous um, thesis argued by Frank Sibley is that aesthetic properties emerge from combinations of basic physical descriptive properties. An additional minimal thesis says that aesthetic properties are nothing more than particular organizations or patterns of properties. Some aesthetic properties um, are gestalt properties. So there's no single physical description that guarantees that something or event is dynamic or balanced or serene. There is for each of these properties, I think, a distinctive gestalt or more probably a cluster of gestalts that characterizes the aesthetic property. And this is what one recognizes when one experiences something a dance performance, say, is being balanced. Now, the difference between, say, spotting and not spotting the balanced dance performance, I think, is plausibly a phenomenological one. Recognizing inexperience an event as balanced is phenomenally distinct from not so recognizing it. Further, I think that this is a, um, a difference in visual experience. And so seeing X as balanced, or and take another example as impressionist, is a perceptual difference and plausibly one in high level or rich properties. It's not that um, spotting being balanced involves representing distinctive colors or shapes or edges, but instead um, it involves differently perceiving how those basic perceptible properties are organized. And this, I think, is rich perceptual content. So some then are aesthetic experts. And I want to just note, I don't have enough time to say much about it, how well this should, uh, it, how it should be apparent how well this comports with the notion of perceptual expertise broadly, as I described it. So 
Aesthetic experts, then, as I understand it, are a subset of experts more generally. Um, so just as there are patterns or gestalts that typify gracefulness, there are patterns or gestalts that typify a tumor in a mammogram or a pattern of offensive play in football. And perceptual content can admit of these tasks and diagnostically uh, relevant patterns and in ways sensitive to domains specific cognitive learning. So while some instances of expert accomplishment plausibly involve rich content, this isn't a condition on expertise or perceptual expertise. OK, what does any of this have to do with creativity? How do we get um, some motivation for the controversial answer? So I want to close by answering two related questions. What further empirical evidence do we have for rich perceptual content and perceptual experts? And second, how would this perceptual advantage generally provide an advantage vis-a-vis -vis the opportunity for creative thought or action? So the first, to answer the first question, I want to say a little bit about um, work on visual short-term memory. So uh, VSTM, as it's sometimes called, is a working memory system that encodes, encodes only visually acquired information. It's limited both with respect to how long representations are available for use and how much information it may store. It shows an advantage for faces. That's uncontroversial. It also shows an advantage um, for objects of expertise for experts. So for example, car experts uh, show a VSTM advantage for cars where despite the complexity of car images, VSTM capacity increases to the capacity normal for very simple objects. So some favor a visual explanation for this advantage by virtue of more efficient holistic processing of objects of expertise, the category specific complexity of an object is already represented by perception. When this representation is then given to VSTM, less resources are needed to store or use the representation since in a sense vision has already done the work of representing the object or bound features as being within a category. So this is the first bit of evidence that I think suggests that perceptual expertise frees cognitive resources. Vision encodes category specific information for the expert such that she can better recall or use details about the objects of expertise. So one way to explain at least partially the unpredictable or surprising or creative move is that visual short term memory for such a perceptual expert, in this case the elite footballer, is already encoding relevant information about the situation, spatial orientations of objects, their speed and direction from, of movement, and the speed and direction of the movement, of, in this case, of the ball. And this is a clear advantage over the less skilled, less, less expert player. So vision does more, as it were, for the expert, and with that richness comes speed, efficiency, and accuracy. Similar stories, I think, could be told for a variety of other domains, the sculptor, the surgeon, the architect. So this advantage, um, in working memory, I think memory is corroborated by a second line of empirical research. So beginning in the 1960s, researchers used pupillary response measures to identify task sensitive um, cognitive load. So in most cases, demands on working memory. So as working memory demands needed for a cognitive task go up, pupil dilation increases linearly. And this is not just uh, exclusive to perceptual tasks. You get this correlation between increased dilation and the performance of, say, um, difficult maths problems. More recently, researchers have used these methods to measure differences in cognitive load, load between experts and novices. And what they find is that the expert physician, for example, by contrast to a resident or medical student, exhibits less pupillary dilation in response to the same domain specific tasks and questions. Again, dilation is taken to correlate with demands on working memory. So this suggests that the expert suggests less cognitive load, less demand on working memory by contrast to novices. And this enables and the pupillary measures corroborate a cognitive efficiency for the expert. So putting these two bits of research together, the reduced stress on working memory for the expert could be enabled by automatic visual pickup of domain relevant information, whether it's patterns or categories. So this would be an important cognitive benefit of genuine perceptual expertise. In turn, I think we get a motivation for the controversial answer. So you get freed up cognitive resources in the expert, which allows for a cognitive manipulation uh, needed or at least useful um, for novel thought and action. So here's the line of thought. For the expert, the visual or other perceptual system is doing automatically some of the domain specific work. It's picking up the information that the non-expert would have to laboriously judge, reason about, infer if she can identify that information at all. And so this frees up um, resources in perception, whether it's visual attention or visual search and in working memory. And that allows for a variety of cognitive manipulation, for imagination of various sorts, for imagery, free association, the things that we think enable or partly enable novelty and thought and action. So on the count of uh, perceptual expertise I'm giving, the expert is already seeing things better than most and performing better than most. 
This frees up cognitive resource or workspaces such that the expert footballer can say, improvise an entirely new move. The expert surgeon can imagine a surprising angle or incision possibly needed to save a life. The master painter can apply an entirely new concept to existing methods of depiction and so on. So when perception does more because of what the perceiver has antecedently done, the perceiver herself can do more and sometimes in novel and interesting ways. So I'm skipping this for the sake of time because I know I've gone over a bit. So um, let me just see where I am so I make sure I close on a intelligible point. <laughs> so the, the controversial answer is plausible for at least some instances of expertise and creativity. The idea is that when one reaches a level of expertise that goes all the way down to the sensory perceptual, um, where vision can say do some of the work for you as a result of what you've learned in a domain, then you have more resources to perform skillfully in novel and innovative ways. So what I will finally want to note is how well this comports with thinking about creativity in the minimal terms that I described. And I'm going to skip these things and just focus on. Um, so I think we by thinking about creativity in terms of this kind of expertise, I think we make some sense of both the opportunity for novelty, but also the way in which we want to credit the agent because these perceptual experts have become experts as a result of their cognitive ideology, as a result of what they have learned. So that brings us back to this puzzle. On the one hand, creative achievement is often described as effortless. It's rapid or in the mo moment. But on the other hand, creativity does seem to be an achievement given our standard practice of praising creative acts and their makers. So insofar as it contributes to some creative acts, perceptual expertise makes sense of this tension. So as I've explained it, some experts de develop a reliable perceptual disposition or skill and one that affords cognitive resources for novel thought and action. That skill often deploys automatically most centrally in ecologically valid contexts. This automaticity makes some sense of the apparent effortlessness and speed and perhaps surprise of some creative acts. So that's one half of the puzzle. But because this skill is the consequence of the expert's cognitive lab labors within her domain, those labors are part of the etiology of her perceptual skills and something for which she bears responsibility, I think she's to be credited for instances when those skills deploy, even if they deploy seemingly um, without effort. So I think we dissolve the puzzle, at least in some cases, uh, which is supposed to center around a tension between um, agency and novelty. So it's in this sense that some creative individuals are perceptual experts. Some instances of creativity uh, involve instances of perceptual expertise, and the first can be partly explained in novel ways, I think, uh, by the second. Thank you very much. Sorry for um, going on a bit too long. Thank you very much, Dustin. And uh, you both were spot on time, so that's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so now we will open the discussion. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, so if you would like to pose a question, just raise your virtual hand or um, type your question in the chat. Um, but we usually, um, actually, Justin, Dustin, can I can I ask you uh, yep. to stop sharing the screen? Um, but yeah, so usually uh, what we would like to do to kickstart the discussion, we ask uh, our uh, speakers uh, to kind of uh, respond to each other's talk and if you have any questions to, to ask to, to the other. Uh, so perhaps, Rebecca, would you like to, uh, to start first? Yeah, so um, something that um, has always troubled me as someone who's, who yeah, has investigated from a psychological perspective, artistic expertise a lot is sort of what is the domain of artistic expertise? So it, it's very easy in the case of sort of ornithologists and surgeons to identify the, the, the domain specificity of, of the kinds of perceptual expertise um, that we're dealing with, which I think is why it's sort of easier to do experiments on these individuals than it is with artists. And I just wonder whether you've ha you have any reflections on um, the yeah where the where the where the boundaries of um the sort of domain of perceptual expertise with reference to art is in the sense that i guess the conclusion i sort of came to was that the the domain is determined by um the task that the artist is doing so when they're engaged in an artistic task that shapes um the kinds of perceptual representations they have because we would never go so far as to say that you know that that the artist's perceptual experience is changed you know 
totally for you know um forever um so yeah i'm sort of interested in that that sort of perspective if that makes sense Ab absolutely um so i mean you're putting your finger on uh, a, a difficulty that myself and my colleagues have experienced firsthand because it's very difficult to operationalize and then put into work experiments on experts who are artists. <laughs> um, and I think it's no coincidence that uh, the Vote in Magnus Magnuson 2006 piece and then some of Aaron Cosbalt's works, they both just essentially do what is done in other areas of perceptual expertise, so radiology, ornithology, etc. There are some just standards that come with uh, the domain that sort of give you uh, the norms for, for being an expert, statistically quantified typically, right? And, and you're exactly right. You can typically get that oper operationalization because there's a task that is there to be performed. And so um, in the Vote and Magnuson and in the Cosvault studies, they go to art schools and the Vote and Magnuson study, they're, they're, they place very high demands. I think their subjects had seven to 12 years of training in art school. Um, and in uh, Cosvault's work, he, he of course, uh, made sure that these students had substantial training in drawing. Uh, so we had very particular, you know, sort of application. And I think those are the places to start. You know, I can tell you from experience, you don't go out looking for people who self identify as artists and then try to do a visual um, expertise task on them. That fails miserably. Um, and so we we have a piece that has just come out recently in the Psychonomic Bulletin and Review where we compare both behavioral measures and eye tracking measures on radiologists and architects. And we landed on architects because it was much easier to identify a task, both for which there was a clear um, set of norms for success and there was a clear kind of regimen of, of training um, because we just went to, to uh, um, practicing architects who, who were using softwares um, to design. And then we gave them essentially um, um, these geometric vanishing point uh, images where there was some small anomaly with respect to where the where a, say a rectangular figure should be positioned relative to the vanishing point. And that seemed to be very similar to the kind of radiology task. And, and so we used actually the two subject groups as controls, as if that makes any sense, and had them perform mm -hmm. opposite tasks. And that I, I could say a lot more about that. But the 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 short answer is I think it's if you want to identify artistic expertise in the perceptual instance, you're going to have to narrow your scope quite substantially to cases where there's some recognizable form of training that comes with certain standards such that you can establish the baseline for expertise. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, sort of what came to my mind was, you know, maybe you, you might want to contrast artists with particular expertise within a particular visual class. So, you know, there's been research on the portrait artist Humphrey Ocean um, to show how he, how his neural response to faces is different. And it kind of goes in line with what you were saying that actually you see an attenuation of activation in areas that uh, specialize in faces like fusiform face area um, and an increase in activation in frontal regions, which sort of suggests yeah, this idea that um, there's higher level um, processing going on and mm -hmm. that processing is more efficient in areas that are specialized for that visual class of objects. But I think that might be a good way to sort of, yeah, get it, get at the, I guess, the specificity of the perceptual expertise. Because as I said, I don't think anyone is sort of saying that the way in which artists process visual simile is irrevocably changed because often it's very much at odds with the kind of processing we need to do for everyday vision. Um, so it's, um, and, that, and that is, I've found some evidence of that in some of my research as well, that when sort of free viewing images, artists take one particular kind of attentional attitude and then when they're drawing, obviously that that changes. And so we might see the, the deployment of that perceptual expertise very much when they're engaged in an artistic task rather than when they're processing the world for for different purposes which you know makes sense that's right i mean and that comports well with um what you find in the literature on on non-artistic perceptual experts i mean there, there's this so-called non-transferability phenomenon which you might think that the radiologist because she's especially good at visual search tasks is going to be really good at um a where's waldo puzzle 
but it turns out that um, you know that it, it's a very domain specific kind of sensitivity. It's not just an improved ability at say searching a visual array, um, and mm -hmm. so you would expect that same kind of domain specificity for um, an artistic expert if indeed you you've identified the relevant visual domain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for uh, such a great start. Um, the, um, I guess I have a slightly follow up question what, what you're, you're talking about. Because uh, um, you both uh, um, kind of mentioned this concept of uh, uh, innovation and innovativeness. And I wondered if you, yeah, if you would like to expand a bit more and on the, uh, how to quantify and how to, I guess, measure innovation, and especially in the context of art, as Rebecca, you uh, you mentioned in your presentation that highly depends on perhaps uh, like uh, art styles and uh, uh, different um, schools of of art. So. Um, I guess that one of the challenges to, to define and then measure creativity is it, it has to be compared to something. And so that goes back to what you were discussing so far in the having kind of standard and um, relating it to, uh, to a domain specific um, skills that can be quantified. So I, I guess I just wanted to, it's not, it's, not, it's not a real question, but I just wanted to have your thoughts uh, more on the, on the concept of innovativity. Uh, and I'm thinking about the, the Maya principle, uh, so the uh, the most advanced yet acceptable um, innovation that which is used in in design so when you want to introduce some sort of uh change in the in the, in the software or in the in the design um you have to introduce something that is still familiar so uh, um i was wondering in the also the role of familiarity in creativity and in applying creativity and measuring it uh what do you think would, would that be in this context and I guess it's it's for it's for both speakers. So uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rebecca, do you want do you want to? No, I'm happy for you to jump in. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, that there's a lot that there's a lot of very good suggestions and and insights there. So I, I guess one thing with respect to innovativeness, I mean, uh, here too, I think. I mean, I'm very compelled. This this doesn't help in terms of operationalizing anything, but I'm very compelled by something like Maggie Bowden's distinction. And I think, you know, innovativeness or novelty. Um, I think there are different levels of description that we might, you know, take with respect to a particular achievement. And I think if you want to know whether something is innovative in some capital I sense, then you're right. There's going to have to be a kind of big comparison class. It's going to have to be, you know, innovative relative to visual art or innovative relative to moves in a football match, or et cetera. And that in some ways, it's not a strictly psychological phenomenon. It's we're, we're comparing what this person has done relative to a whole bunch of other people. Um, and in some respects, I think that's a virtue of, of Maggie's distinction, which is that if you want to know about the psychology, you in some respects have to set to one side the the sociology or the broader, you know, the kind of social comparison be insofar so, so that you can kind of hone in on what kinds of more basic psychological mechanisms are going on when when we make any kind of minimal novel um, or have any kind of minimal novel thought or action. Um, so I don't think there's going to be any way to operationalize what counts as innovative. Um, there, I think there are ways to 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 operationalize what counts as an expert because you just you just give you just take those from the domain and relativize them to success perform at, at performing a task. But in terms of newness or novelty or innovativeness, I think that's a real mess. <laughs> you know, I think there's a sense in which we know it when we see it, but um, that's not helpful if you want to, you know, identify some. Uh, a reliable measure for innovativeness. I really liked what you picked up on Dustin about novelty, about the idea that it can be novel to you as an individual, even if it, and I think that that's an interesting distinction that, that probably isn't picked up enough and is sort of captured in this 4C model of creativity where you sort of have mini C and, and little C that you can have these small, um, sort of democratizes creativity, like creativity happens at the level of 
you know, when I go to my fridge in the evening and I don't know what to cook and then I, you know, I come up with a novel um, combination of ingredients. Um, so again, I think you you constantly have to specify um, like, um, yeah, the boundaries of, you know, uh, um, how is that novelty being calculated in relation to what? And then as a as a psychologist, you have to, yeah, you have to specify those boundaries and then and and I, yeah, I would say that it, like the wider those boundaries become, the more potentially the more difficult it is to uh, to pinpoint. And in relation to this issue of sort of familiarity, I think it um, sort of overlaps with the, I guess, the counterpoint of of novelty in in creativity theories, which is utility. So if I can't identify that this is a useful solution if it's novel, and that might be like that might be conflated with, you know, if something's very unfamiliar, I might not be able to recognize its ability to to function within a specific area. So I think this is sort of captured by by that. So yeah, if a design is too out there and I can't um, understand how to relate to that product anymore and use it, then that outweighs any any novel factor um, that, you know, that that most, um, impre- sort of most theories of creativity um, include a balance between you know we can't have something that is just you know it can be totally novel but if it's completely useless if it doesn't uh fit a brief or um or meet a goal then we usually say that it's um it's it's creativity is not is not valuable that's right i mean i think with the caveat i think it would even sharper than that you just deny it attribution of creativity i mean that yeah. psychologist yeah. operationalized that definition but really it traces back to kant you know he said if, if it's useless but novel it's not it's it's not what yeah. we think of it's a important. necessary condition of yeah. yeah something being construed as creative yeah and i guess this kind of um uh, kind of puts. Uh, I'm, I'm just. I'm just m- made me think of um, this a, a bit of a paradox because in art, uh, um, most of the time the function of an artwork is not that clear. Or perhaps there are also artists that mm, claim the art. Uh, I mean, there, there's there are different um, art schools that claim the art should not uh, have a function apart from art itself. So I was wondering. Uh, yeah, how would that apply uh, to to the to the domain of art? Um, I suppose it's yeah, it's I guess it's um yeah, it depends how you define function. Um, a sort of yeah, I guess most 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 artists would reject the idea that art has a practical function. Like if I go into um, an exhibition and there's some kind of installation with a chair and I go and sit on it that's not really you know I'm not I'm not tapping into the inherent function of the artwork but art does have a function um, in provoking reactions um, you know thinking emotions reasoning Um, so I think it's just yeah it's about our perspective on on what we mean by the the function of art Um, so yeah I'm not I'm not hugely troubled by that but I think it is it does sort of raise a question that I I was thinking when when Dustin was talking about um the relationship between things like artistic and scientific creativity we do know from the literature that some of the predictors of these forms of um creative achievement are slightly different so in that model I presented with um the influence of openness to experience and intelligence openness to experience tends to be a better predictor of artistic creativity or whilst the role of intelligence seems to be stronger in um scientifically creative output so i think um i guess we should be wary to try and come up with uh some kind of understanding of creativity that that doesn't take into account that there are domain specific differences in how i guess the creative process how how a how an individual gets from point A to B within their particular domain. Um, I think historically, the differences between artistic and scientific creativity have been exaggerated, but I think we run the risk potentially of ignoring really important differences um, in those processes, in in the process of saying, you know, looking for similarities. So, yeah, I don't know, Dustin, if you want to speak to that. Uh, I mean, I, I have a lot to say, but I want to make sure we, we get some other questions in. But I, yeah. I, I think there is, I think for sure that that difference has been overplayed. Um, I think as soon as you enter into the context of um, theorizing art and creativity and art, 
lots of the familiar challenges just come because in the context of art where people say there's no function, there's no task, how could you possibly, you know, it, it, it's the same thing that my aesthetic students say to me when I, when I teach definitions of art, you know, they, three out of four will say you can't define art. And, and they, then they're probably right at the end of the day, but you have to, you can't let them say that right out of the gates because there, you know, there is at least sensible things that can be said about um, how we treat art as an artifact. And, and it does seem to have, you know, a, a fairly reliable set of practices that we take towards it. And, and those get violated, manipulated and, and tweaked, but um, that doesn't, I think, undermine the possibility that there's a thing there that we treat as art. I also think that, um, you want to distinguish in thinking about creativity and art and creativity and uh, science. I have started to think a lot about creativity and sport and creativity and kind of more technical contexts. You want to distinguish features of creativity in that context that just come with the context because there's different things being done, different content being consumed and so on from the mechanisms that are being used, you know, perception, imagination and so on. And imagination might look different on its face because you're imagining um, performing surgery rather than performing depiction, but it might ultimately be that that's just a difference in the kind of content, but not a difference in, you know, the, the broad psychological mechanism, namely imagination. So I think sometimes there's a, these things get, um, uh, disjointed or, or, or overly distinguished for reasons that don't have to necessarily do with the psychological mechanisms that, um, undergird creativity. Sorry, I just have to let my cat out. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> no worries. Um, well, um, while we wait for Rebecca, I can see that uh, Marina has her hand raised. So would you like to post your question, Marina? Yes, thank you. Um, thanks a lot for your very interesting talks. Now, when Rebecca, when you were talking about this attentional flexibility and how people manage to detect a single in the noise, um, just I know that this theory of how people detect signals is applied to explain schizophrenia, at least some aspects of schizophrenia, such as hallucinations, and it's kind of one of the theories which try to explain why they occur in people with schizophrenia as their hyper tendency, increased tendency to detect signals in the noise, even if it's a false alarm. Um, so the question, um, does it mean that there is like a continuum where people have this uh, underdeveloped tendency to detect signals, even if there are signals to detect on one side of this extreme of this continuum and another place of continuum, people have this increased tendency to see signals when there are and aren't any, like in the case of schizophrenia. Um, does it mean that it is like that, and if it is like that, because I know that at least clinical psychologists, psychologists in abnormal psychology, have now this very popular idea that normal and pathological lies on a continuum, when normal is in the middle and all pathological is um, are, are two extremes. Uh, but in the case of creativity, it's a tricky thing. Does it mean that creativity is in the middle? Because creativity, more creative thinking, like genius thinking, is something of a kind of extreme. Does it mean that this is also an abnormality because this is mm. highly speculated in art that many genius people in art also had some mental issues like James Joyce and Vincent Van Gogh and whatnot. But just this question, does it mean that this is a continuum? And if it is, mm. then creative thinking, is it in the middle or is it a bit of extreme? And how is that different from abnormal thinking in this case, in schizophrenia? Say yeah. Yeah, that um, that's a really good point. And obviously there is this sort of per pervasive na narrative that there's a relationship between creativity and mental illness. Inevitably, the empirical evidence for that link becomes um, very, very messy. I mean, that there are sort of indications that there might be particular uh, propensities that are then um, in the extreme are associated with mental illness. It's certainly the case that um, being in an active stage of um, of mental illness, be it um, schizophrenia or a, a bipolar episode, um, massively diminishes creativity and creative output. Um, but it's the case that um, it seems to be individuals with heightened um, traits that don't meet the the criteria for diagnostic for a mental um, uh, a diagnosis of a mental illness. 
uh, tend to be more creative. And it might be that, yeah, so when I was talking about uh, pareidolia, I was sort of alluding to this. So we so uh, we know from some research that, yeah, it's associated with uh, what are called schizotypic tendencies, which are subclinical traits associated with schizophrenia, like um, uh, particularly sort of, um, yeah, like uh, borderline sort of hallucination or, you know, spiritual beliefs and, and, and this kind of thing. So I think that, um, yeah, it's probably the case that, um, yeah, this this sort of ability or the or this tendency to see see signal and noise is, yeah, my prediction would be it's elevated in creative individuals, but not to the level that um, we see in um, in individuals with diagnosis. And there's quite a nice model proposed by Shelley Carson a while ago called the shared vulnerability model, which tries to explain this link between creativity and mental illness. And it essentially says that people who are um, vulnerable to me uh, mental illness and people who tend to be more creative have a set of shared vulnerability factors. She talks specifically about this concept of latent inhibition, which is the inability to sort of tune out irrelevant um, stimuli. Um, but that in the presence of protective factors, this leads to creative behavior. So if you have uh, things like high IQ, high working memory, so generally stuff that's associated with executive function protects an individual against um, uh, moving more into the kind of um, diagnostic realm and being able to use that creativity. So again, I think um, the importance of these inhibitory mechanisms um, and things like intelligence and working memory really come to the fore. So they are coupled with maybe some of these sensory attentional vulnerabilities uh, that might, yeah, move someone more into the into the yeah the creative side of things. Sounds That's, great. Yeah, you mean that like, kind of the difference is that people with schizophrenia can't control uh, abnormal perceptions like hallucinations. They can just appear even if they don't want to hear them. They still hear them or see them. They kind of don't have this ability to control all them. Yeah, I think yeah, that's the idea that these yeah the protective or the or the risk factors are about yeah potentially being able to to manage those and um, exhibit sort of top down control over over those oh, things. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, um, we've been talking a lot about. Um, um, perceptual expertise uh, and uh, the way that that is domain specific and it can free up um, cog cognitive thinking that enables creativity. And perhaps um, I just want to launch there a provocation. Uh, uh, do we need to talk about creativity at all uh, in this case then? Can't we just talk about expertise? Uh, what is what, what would be the difference, like theoretically, uh, if uh, if most of uh, what we talk about when we think about creativity is linked with those, um, yeah, with 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 expertise? Um, so the cheeky response, I think that I, I'm, you want me to answer this one first, or yes, please, yeah. yeah. I mean, the cheeky response is we can definitely talk about expertise without talking about creativity, and I just published a book with Routledge that talks about that. So, <laughs> you, I mean, I, I think we can talk about expertise as as um, distinct from uh, you know it, it's it's yielding uh, creative output. Um, but I, I guess the the reason I thought it, it that I think it's 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 an interesting extension, and in some ways this walks back my agreement with Rebecca about the overemphasis on the kind of insight aha moments. But I, I think there's something remarkable, and this is one of the most puzzling and interesting phenomena or, or subcomponents of the phenomena of creativity. There's something remarkable about these effortless moments of insight and, uh, you know, that both with respect to how they occur, both with respect to how they seem to be effortless. Um, and so the thought was that we might make some headway on that apparent advantage for, um, for creative individuals by explaining it in some cases as a perceptual advantage. They, they, they see better in a, in a certain context. And I think it's a, it's more, um, evident perhaps in performance contexts, you know, performing musically or per performing a dance or 
um, playing football or, or what have you. And, and often um, those are instances where the task itself requires you to think or perform very quickly and in response to some perceptual, often moving perceptual ar array. Um, I think that this will give us may give us some purchase on some cases of of creativity, but I I also think that it will probably give us no purchase on other instances of creativity. You know, I don't think it's going to do anything interesting for us in thinking about literary creativity, and I, I certainly don't think it's going to get us um, purchase on lots of cases of scientific creativity that are not especially visual or perceptual in nature. Um, but I've also I don't think that's a, a limitation to the approach. I, as a philosopher of mind, have almost entirely abandoned the thought that we can explain mental phenomena in some sort of singular way, that you know, there's a singular explanation for creativity as such, or imagination as such, or I, I think our minds are really messy, and I think that that kind of um, methodology is is limiting. I mean, I think it's 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 I don't want to say it's the orthodoxy in philosophy, but in certain quarters, it certainly is. It's it's almost as if if you don't have a unified explanation for the phenomenon or the explanandum that you're after, then then you're just already starting short of your opponents. But I think when we talk about the mind, that's um, I think that that's that's got to be wrong. That's a bit of an overarching just kind of methodology that that I um, that I maintain. But as it as applied to creativity, I think we're going to get hopefully some stuff you know, like imagination or, um, you know, some basic psychological mechanisms that are part of our explanation of creativity. But then there's going to be a whole long disjunction of, you know, other parts of the explanation that attach to only some, but not all instances of creativity. Yeah, my, I don't think my thoughts are, are super clear on this, but I think it, it's, it makes me think about sort of where we where we think sort of creativity lies and maybe it's this sort of overemphasis on the product and again from a kind of practical research point of view it, it it's a lot easier to look at creative output and a creative achievement and look at predictors of that than it is to look at the process whereas i think with expertise it's it's all about the process. We look at, you know, how visual stimuli are processed. All of our experimental paradigms are designed to understand how how is how is this stimulus being perceived. Um, whereas I think in reality these two things are obviously interwoven, and and um, and this, yeah, I'm I'm in agreement. That I think this perceptual um, skill is utilized as a it is a form of creativity in its own right. I mean, yeah, I'm finding it hard to describe, but I think the, these two things are much, much more closely interlinked than I think we, yeah, I think it maybe comes down to a, um, a problem of concept and definition around creativity and expertise that they, that they seem these kind of very distinct things. But I think, yeah, in reality, the, there's yeah, the boundaries between the two are not are not very distinct to me, to be honest. Thank you very much for uh, thank you very much both to, for your for your answers. And I think that, yeah, ending on the note uh, that um, mental processes are are complex. Uh, oh, yes. Can I, if, since we have a, um, a few minutes left, if it's OK, I was going to just offer a suggestion in response to Rebecca's um, discussion that, that I just want, I've already noted that I agree that there is, and I'm guilty of this, a, an overemphasis on the sort of, you know, the insight um, stage, so to speak, of creativity and an underemphasis on the kind of evaluation stage. But I think for reasons that you just articulated, that's, we've got, we've got very good reasons that are kind of already there to, to, to not solely focus on the insight stage. And that's precisely because I think we do think of creativity as an achievement that involves a process, often it's a very long one. And so one suggestion I had to kind of further maybe leverage your your um, your prescription that we should shift the emphasis a bit is that I, I think that it's, I've become more inclined to think about creativity in virtue theoretic terms. So the kind of, there's a whole literature out on this, but the, you know, some basics are um, in virtue of epistemology, you think about certain cognitive achievements as involving a kind of intellectual virtue, right? So you've got some sort of task and you can you can perform better or well relative to the standards that come with that task. 
Um, and what's important, and this is what distinguishes, uh, say, a virtue epistemology from other kind of theories of knowledge, is that the kind of focal point for um, evaluation for praise is the agent rather than some subpersonal mechanism. It's, it's the agent that has achieved this thing that's done this thing. And you could see why that would um, sit well with an analysis of creativity. And the other thing that often you find in, in virtue theoretic epistemology is an emphasis on motivation. And this kind of thought connected with your, your mention of persistence, because these individuals have to persist sometimes against very, you know, un undesirable odds to to develop this insight into something that ultimately is is something that we we call creative. So the virtue of epistemologies um, or some virtue epistemologies often put an emphasis on virtues as a kind of acquired excellence, which involves motivation and, and in your terms, persistence. So that might, for what it's worth, be a, a theoretical kind of angle to further hook people into your your prescription, which is that we should we should focus more on or at least uh, some more on the the kind of evaluation stage rather than just the insight stage. Sorry, I hope that wasn't hijacking um, the, the discussion. Yeah, and it actually, sorry, I'm just going to close out. I'm aware we have two more minutes, so it's fine. Um, but another kind of question or insight I had for you is that maybe this perceptual expertise um, can be deployed in, in the service of this kind of evaluative mechanism, because in order to understand what is different about this product that I made today versus this product that I made um, yesterday or this incision that a surgeon made versus the, in, the same incision that he made last week is the ability to dis discriminate what is good and what is bad. And I think that comes as a function of perceptual expertise, because if we can't discriminate those differences, then we're not able to make a prediction about whether one will lead to a better outcome than the other. So I think actually it it tracks more of the, yeah, it frees up these resources, but it also probably enables us to be better discerners um, of the, yeah, the potential sort of consequences of those creative actions. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I see that we are running out of time, unfortunately. So thank you again um, for your brilliant presentations. And next time we meet next week, next Friday, to discuss um, uh, beauty and, uh, uh, and morality. So the beautiful and the good, whether um, these two things are related or maybe they are independent and not related to each other. Um, hope to see you all there and have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank you very much again. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you so much both so Reverend and Martin for uh, <laughs> such an uh, uh, interesting talks and discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Ciao.